I'm John Duvall. This is the Scriptural Way Bible Study. Lord, we come before thee. The Scriptural Way Bible Study is brought to you by the Seminole Point Church of Christ, located at 16300 North May Avenue, Oklahoma City. On behalf of the elders and members of the Seminole Point Church of Christ, I would like to thank you for your interest in spiritual matters. Now, let's take our Bibles and seek the scriptural way. Well, good evening, everybody. <clears throat> let's try that again. Good evening, everybody. Um, I got kissed by a frog. The only thing I can figure happened. Not Rhonda as a frog. But um, y'all know Sunday night my voice started taking leaving services before I did. And, um, but it's stronger than it was yesterday, so we're doing better. Welcome to our Tuesday night class. We are continuing our study of Extreme Personal Makeover. Tonight we're still looking at accountability. For those viewing on the Internet, I want to thank you for taking the time to view this study. I want you to know that you can participate in the study if you would like. We would invite that, encourage that. If you're viewing the study through the Scriptural Way website, then just use the form below the viewing window. Um, and if you're watching it through the SeminolePoint.org website, you can click on or use your email program to send questions or comments to questions at SeminolePointCFC.org. All of that on your viewing window. Before we begin with our study today, I'd like to begin with a word of prayer. And I want to ask John Hall, if you would, to direct our minds in that prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before thee in prayer, and we give thee thanks, Lord, for this wonderful day that you've given us. We're thankful, Lord, for all the blessings that we have through you and all the many good things that you provide us. We're thankful, Lord, for our homes that we have to live in, for our clothes to wear and our food to eat, to nourish our bodies. We're thankful for this nation that we live in, that we can study thy word this evening without fear of persecution, that we can live for thee and serve thee each day of our lives without fear. We pray, Lord, that we would continue to strive each day to glorify and serve thee. We pray that we would continue to study thy word, that we might grow in our knowledge and our faith of thee, and that we might continue to spread the truth to others around us who are lost, that they might also turn to you before it is too late that their souls may be saved. We know, Lord, that we do fall short at times. We pray that you would forgive us for those sins as we repent and turn from them, and that we would be more diligent to resist the evil one each day. We pray that you go with us through this study, that our minds might reflect upon the things that are taught as they come from thy word, that we might apply them to our lives and go into the world and shine as a light to the world, that they might see you living in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, let's be turning in our lessons to page number seven. We're in our ongoing study of accountability. In our overall study of extreme personal makeover. Accountability, I do believe, is probably one of the greatest neglected subjects. We try to teach our young ones, as we've already been looking at through the course of the study, the importance of learning to be accountable. And to not only hold, not only to understand that others will hold you accountable, but for us to hold ourselves accountable. Now, where we are starting tonight is looking at accountability to other Christians. So go to the bottom of page 7. The bottom of page 7 there. Accountability to other Christians. If you are viewing online, uh, you'll see a link there. You should see a link on the screen where you can download a copy of the lesson. Sarah, would you mind grabbing a couple of extra copies from the front if we have? And there, here's some, Sarah. There you go. If you'll pass those out to anybody else who doesn't have one. Now, <clears throat> let's first be opening our Bibles to 1 John chapter 4. We're going to read that first. 1 John chapter 4. The first thing we're going to look at in our study tonight is that Christians have a responsibility to possess a working love for other Christians. I'm amazed a number of times within my lifetime. I have heard one Christian speak of another Christian in extremely hateful terms. 
You know, and it's always, it's, it's like the Sunday morning lesson. It was titled, I love you, Lord, but. Okay. Oftentimes you'll hear Christians say, I love them, but you know, they just think. <laughs> I don't want to be around them. I love them, but. You know, it's, it's the way in the South, you, you, in the South you could criticize a person any, any, with anything you wanted to, as long as you said, bless their heart. Bless their heart. That's the ugliest dress I've ever seen. You would never say that's the ugliest dress I've ever seen unless you have blessed their heart first, you know. So I think sometimes we, we don't, at least Christians face the battle uh, of showing, uh, possessing the working love for one another. So let's start with 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, and John, we'll start up here with you tonight. If you would please start reading for us in verse 7, and go ahead and take the context down to 12, please. Beloved, beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent His only begotten Son to the world, that we might live through Him. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and His love has been perfected in us. All right, back up to verse 7 here for just a moment. The very first thing he says here is, Beloved, let us love one another. He says, For love is of God. And notice the next phrase in your Bible. And everyone who loves is what? Born of God. Now let's think about that for just a minute. He says it's born of God. In John chapter 3, verses 3 through 4, Nicodemus asked Jesus, What must one do to inherit eternal life? What, did, what was Jesus' reply to Nicodemus? Unless one is what? Born of water and spirit. Yeah, that's right. This, first off, he says, unless one is born again. And so he says, well, how can I be born again unless one enters into his mother's womb a second time? So Jesus says, unless one is born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Well, there we have an introduction of the concept of being born again to start anew. Um, let's turn in our Bibles. This isn't in the lesson text, but turn over to 1 John 1, or 1 Peter 1. And Jennifer, would you mind reading verses 22 and 23 of 1 Peter chapter 1, please? Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth to the Spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God which lives and abides forever. Right, what does he say here that we have been born again of? This is not of what, but what? Yeah. We're not born again of the corruptible seed, but of that incorruptible seed. What is that incorruptible seed? It's the Word of God. Yeah. And actually he clarifies, through the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. So again, it's the idea of being born again. Now, if we're born again, who is our Father? God. God. Michael, let's turn over, turn your Bibles to the book of Romans, chapter 8. Again, these verses are not in the lesson text, but we're going to go to Romans, chapter 8. And, Michael, if you would, please read for us verses 14 through 17 of Romans, chapter 8. And speak, kind of speak up there. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heir, heirs with Christ, if, we, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified to you. All right, back up to verse 14. So, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are what? Sons. Sons of God. And then verse 15, he says, We didn't receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father, or Father, Father. So, when an individual becomes a Christian, they are born again. They become one of God's children through the spirit of adoption. Oftentimes, you'll hear people talk about people throughout the whole world. All people in the world are God's children. And only in the sense 
that they are created by him. But in the true sense of being God's children, they are not. For only those who are led by the Spirit, those who answer the gospel's call into salvation, those who submit themselves unto God in humble obedience, they are the ones who are truly the children of God by that spirit of adoption. Now, with that in mind, we're talking about the process of being born again. He says, those that have been born of God do what? Let's turn back in our text there to 1 John 4. And if anyone has a question or comment who is viewing online, please do not hesitate to send it to us. John up here will um, throw something at me if we have a question that will come in, and we will look at that. And locally, of course, too, just raise your hand. Now, go back to the text again. So he says, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. So when he says, everyone who loves is born of God. Now, understand it in the context. It's simply this. If we are the children of God, we're going to behave like God. God is love. Therefore, if we have truly are following in the footsteps of our Father, what are we going to do? Love. We are going to love. Okay? So it is in that context. For he says in verse 8, He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Truly, how can an individual say that he hates his brother, and at the same time, oh, I know God. I know all about God. I understand what God is all about. But yet, he doesn't understand one of the greatest of principles, and that is that godly love. Any thoughts or comments so far? <clears throat> Right, look at verse 9. So he says, In this the love of God was manifested. Now we, we understand this. God showed us his love in that he sent Jesus into the world that we might live through him. So there's an outward manifestation of love. Can we say that we love someone and not show that love? We can say it, but would we be lying? Yes. Sir. Very probably. Okay. The reason why I say that, you can say that, oh, I love all the Christians down in the Philippines. But unless you travel over there, or you have some opportunity to, to, to show that love, you'll never be able to show it. All right, But you can love them. But take a, a brother who is local to you. If you say you love the brother, but yet you treat him in a hateful, in a spiteful, or, or you even ignore his needs when you have what it is that he needs, then to say that you love him is fundamentally a lie. Because God said, I love you. Now I'm sending your son to die for you. Now you have the same love for one another. Obviously paraphrasing it. All right, any thoughts? All right, draw attention again here back now to verse 10. So in this is love. Not that we love God. Our love for God is not the definition of love but that he loved us and sent his son to be the preparation for our sins. So beloved of God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And then finally in 12, no one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. So according to this text, does God abide in Christians who have the proper love for one another? Yes. Absolutely. What would be another word that we could use in place of God abides in us? There's another word that we can use, that God would have what with us? Fellowship. Fellowship. Yeah. That's fundamentally what he's talking about there. When he, anytime you talk about, you read the Bibles, and you read about the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, Christ dwelling in us, Christ is in you as you are in Christ, we are in God, God is in us, we're talking about fellowship, working together, being in joint union, joint workmanship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So with that in mind, he says, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. If Christians do nothing else in the life as a Christian, let it be the only thing they do is to love one another. If, if you're only going to do one thing, let it at least be that. Because that's one of the defining definitions of love. Any thoughts or comments? Or of your Christianity, I should say. Any thoughts? John? I was going to say, I think, you know, it's important to maybe consider what love is being discussed here and not looking up ahead of time. I'm fairly sure this is the agape love, not the phileo love. It's the love of value. You know, you value the person's best interest. You know, as God valued us and cared for us, he sent his son. Yeah. It, wasn't, it wasn't emotional. It wasn't an emotional love. Um, right. You know, 
but it was the value, and that's the way that we should be towards our brethren. We might not always have a deep emotional connection to them in some way, but we should always value them and have that kind of love for them that we would um, treat them properly and, and provide for them the needs that they have if we can, um, those types of things. I think that's a good point. He's not talking about brotherly love. He's, he's talking about the, the agape love that he had for us. Um, and I think, I think it's a very excellent point because when you stop and consider what God did for us, not one person was deserving of it. Not one person was deserving of God to send his son. But because of his love for us, as we'll read here in a minute, he manifested his love towards us. And that while we were still sinners, he sent his son to die. And so that sets the tone for the whole love and the type of love. Not, it's not an emotional love. And interestingly enough, although it's on a whole other subject altogether, husbands are told to love their wives as what? Christ loved the church. Yeah, let's bring that type of love into the marriage relationship as well. Okay. All right, any other thoughts? All right, let's turn to the next page. <clears throat> and notice with me, if you would, we're going to look at 1 John 3, verses 17 through 18. You can turn there in your Bibles if you want. It is in our lesson text. By the way, all the quotes in this lesson is from the New King James Version, unless otherwise stated. Okay. Um, Alan, sir, would you mind reading top of page 8, the 1 John 3, 17 through 18, please. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, he does, he does the love of God abide in him. My little ch children, let us not love in the world or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Okay. There are so many different ways that love is to be manifested and can be manifested within our life. And there's also so many different ways to show that fundamentally we truly don't love a particular person or we don't love our brethren. In this case in point, he identifies. He says, whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? Now, in order to to be accountable for helping someone, and in this case in point, we're talking about showing love towards a brother, you have to have a couple of things. First off, you have to have a brother who's in need, okay? But you also have to have the means by which to help them, and you have to have an opportunity to help them, okay? There are going to be people in your life who will be in need, Christians who will be in need, you'll never know about. Or there'll be Christians in need, and you know about it, but you don't have the funds to help them with. Or there may be times in your life where you'll have plenty of means to help, but you can't find anyone to help just because of the limited contact. But the point he's addressing here, if you have a Christian who sees that his brother here is in need, and he does what to his heart? Shuts up his heart unto him. So the question is then, how does the love of God abide in him? Now, the connecting point in this is the fact of this. God saw that we had a need. God opened his heart up to us and gave us what we had need of. And we're talking about salvation, obviously. And so therefore, we do the same thing. All right? And then that latter part, my little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but how? That's right. And word or tongue, that's easy, you know, and, and sometimes maybe we might get in the habit of it. We'll tell someone, bye, I love you, love you now, take care, love you, you know. Just kind of throw it out there as a nice little uh, salutation, you know, departing statements. But he says, let not the love be in word or tongue. This is a, this is a, a not or statement, or not but statement. Meaning that the latter is not to rule out the first. We are to love in word or in tongue. But in the context here, it is not to be only that, but in deed and in truth. Any thoughts or comments? That's why people say actions speak louder than words. That's right. It's a yeah. biblical concept. Okay. Um, he says, in deed and in truth, think about Romans 12, 9, let love be without hypocrisy. So if you state you love them, you're going to show that you love them, let it be a sincere love for them. Okay. Any other thoughts or comments? All right. John, do we have any coming from the... Outside of the building. 
Um, again, we solicit all questions and comments. Don't hesitate. And, and if, if, if you happen to send one in and we don't get it until 10 minutes after we're on that point, we will come back and address it. So, so let's look at the next verse there in our text, Mr. Tommy. Would you look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17, please? Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Okay. Notice what he says here. Love the brotherhood. Brotherhood of what? Christians. Christians, yeah. Context talking about Christians. Brotherhood is talking about Christians. Love the brotherhood. So if you're going to love the brotherhood, you're going to love the brothers, those that make up the brotherhood. If you're going to love all Christians, you will love the individual Christian. All right, any thoughts or comments about this? Can you see why we say that sometimes this is one of the greatest challenges in the lives of Christians? Because what makes loving others so difficult is that you have to deal with other people. Now, it's easy to love others who love us. It's easy to forgive others who forgive us. But when we deal with others who do not treat us the way that they should, then it makes it harder for us, well, the temptation is for it to make it harder for us to love them. It shouldn't be harder, but it does make it harder. And so we have to work stronger at maintaining the proper attitude. All right, let's look at the next point now. Talking about Christians' accountability to other Christians. Christians have a responsibility of strengthening each other. Let's look at this for a moment. Sarah, if you would read for us, we're looking at Hebrews chapter 12, verses 12 through 13, please. Hebrews 12, verses 12 through 13. Therefore strengthen the hands which hang down and the feet and knees, and make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. So he says, strengthen the what which hangs down? Hands. 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 Okay. And the uh, feeble what? Knees. This, you know, think about an individual who, um, think about the grandmother that has osteoporosis. That's what it's called. Um, I remember my grandmother, the older I got, the shorter she got. And part of it was due to her age, and part of it had to do with her osteoporosis. She was always stooped over, and in, over. And I'm not an overly tall person at all, but I seem like I, you have to shake your head and agree with that, Hannah. Um, I'm not an overly tall person at all, but when you stood, when I stood next to her, I felt like it. Especially the older I got, the older she got as well. And so there would be times that it would almost look like that she could barely get around, and that you would need to go and help her. <coughs> to lift her up. And so here he says, therefore strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet. <coughs> Are there going to be times in our lives as Christians where we may become weak? Yeah. And weak doesn't always necessarily mean sinful. Okay. Just let's understand that. Just because we hit a weak moment doesn't mean that it's because of sin. It may be that we've had a series of challenges within our lives that maybe has challenged our faith. Maybe for whatever reason we've not been able to study as much as we should, not for a lack of disinterest, but for whatever other reasons that may have interfered. And it may be that we need a brother to come up to us and they see us and they see that maybe we're kind of getting weak there. We're, you can spot someone who is sick, you can spot someone who's spiritually sick as well, who's spiritually weak. And so we need to be willing to go up to them and straighten them up. Help to support them and help to set their paths straight for their feet. He says, so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. Now, I, I want you to notice something about that. <clears throat> so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. All right, in a minute we're going to talk about an individual who engages in a sin and you go to them and, and help them. Okay. In that case, the point when you help them, what is it you are seeking for them? Strength. Yeah, but if it's a sin, if they've been overtaken in a fall, you or spiritual, restore such you want. What point are you trying to get them to? To confess their sins. To turn away. Yeah, confess their sins to God. To repent. Okay. But imagine though, Instead of helping a person to repent, you help a person in such a way that he's healed. Um, and let me see if I can convey, and I'm not so sure if this is what the Hebrew writer was talking about, but I think it's a lesson we can pull from this. 
if I engage, let, let's say you, you find out that I've engaged in a particular sin, and you come to me and say, John, I heard that you did this. That's wrong by the scripture. You need to repent and ask God to forgive you. All right, I'll say, thank you. And then I do. But a month later, I slip and I do it again. So you come to me again. And a month later, I slip and I do it again. And I, in between times, I'm kind of resisting the temptation, but I keep falling. All right, then you come up to me and say, you know, you've got a great weakness here. Let's help strengthen you so that you won't keep engaging in the sin. Hence, therefore, maybe the idea of being healed. Does that make sense? Any thoughts or comments? Well, I think also, you know, how it says that it not be dislocated but healed. I mean, with a weak brother, you know, you don't cut them off or neglect them so that they eventually break away, but you go to them and try to build them up and restore them and heal them. Right. The, the, the world will tear us down. And if we allow ourselves to be influenced by the world, we will be torn down. It is up to our brethren to help to build us up. And the stronger we are, the greater we will be in overcoming the sins that we face. I think it's a good point, Sarah. All right, any other thoughts? John? I've got a question um, here. It says, what do you do when the other person won't allow you to show any love for them because they, won't, um, because they want to stay in sin? And everything you say, they take as uh, hate and judgment against them. Well, you do what you can, and then you continue serving God. You know, and the, the, the apostles were, were told at a certain point to essentially recognize when to turn and walk away. Now, oftentimes, though, when, when we think about individuals like this, we get so frustrated because they're lost. And, and, and we know that they are in sin. And we try to go to them in love, and we try to show them what the Bible teaches. But yet, like you said, they accuse us of being judgmental. Why well, you just think that you're better than I am? Where, you know, where, 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 do you, where do you think you have the authority to come after me like this? Well, we show them the truth in love. And if they don't follow it, then we stop. But then we look for another opportunity where we could try to talk to them again. It's like whenever the church has to discipline someone. Uh, and and, and the, the elders issue the order based on 1 Corinthians chapter 5. The elders issue the order there that we're not to have association with them. That was not to eat with them. In other words, not to have the behavior that would condone the relationship. Well, we don't totally, though, ignore them. We do still try to bring them back to the truth. And it may be they don't, they don't want to hear it. But you come back later and come back later. And, of course, pray for them. Any, any other thoughts on that question? Go ahead. Uh, you got a comment here. Mm -hmm. uh, it says, uh, having a companion brings strength. Even the wise man taught this concept. Christians need each other. Ecclesiastes 4, verse 9 through 11. Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, and uh, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they will they will keep warm, but how can one be warm alone? Think about the apostles when they were sent out on the limited commission. What type of grouping were they sent out in? Mm -hmm. Two. Sent out pairs of two. Yeah. Um, but here's the thing we've got to remember. Now, I agree with that point, especially with what, with what Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes there. You work better when you work with someone else because there, there's an accountability factor, there's a strength factor. And a lot of Christians work better with two or more than they do by themselves. Again, like in a marriage relationship, you may have an individual who, if he was to live single all his life, may have a lot of challenges because there's no a, a present accountability there. But when he's married, there is an accountability there. Okay, but... You and another person may be best friends, you may be mates, whatever the situation may be, all the way to the gates of death. But when you get to the gates of heaven, you cross it over by yourself. You know? And so our goal is to help one another get to the point of death so that we're ready to individually stand before the throne of God. And so the strength comes by two or, or more. And so I think it's an excellent idea. And you have some people whose personality types create almost a type of loner disposition. 
and or maybe something happened in the past and they they they, they got um, they lost trust in people, so they don't think they can trust anybody else, and so they don't they they, they think they have to be alone, and that was never intended that way by the Lord, brethren, or to edify and build up one another. Yeah. Sarah. Well, and especially in a congregation, like there's always somebody that can be lifted up in some way or another, and you know if this one particular person is not heeding to your advice or to your, you know, showing them the scriptures, telling them that they're wrong, you can't be brought down by that. But instead, I mean, other Christians, that's their responsibility too, so there should be more people addressing that person, you know, but instead of getting um, uh, brought down by that one person, do what you're supposed to do and then focus on somebody else who could be lifted up in some way. You know? Well, I think that's... That's a very good thought um, because if you're trying to deal with someone alone and you're making no headway and they're rejecting you, that doesn't mean you can't go grab someone else. Go, and, and I don't mean someone else to help, you can, but grab someone else into the situation. It's like Matthew 18 of, of a sort. If a brother has sinned against you, you go to him and talk to him, and if he doesn't hear you, what are you supposed to do? Ask another brother. That's right. You don't tell it to the whole church yet. You go grab another person. So that they may come with you and buy two or three witnesses. All right? And so you're approaching them again. And they don't hear you then. Then you bring it to the church. And if it doesn't hear the church, then of course you, you mark it as the heathen, essentially. All right? So there are times, and this goes back to the question we had a while ago. If, if someone is rejecting your counsel, then... Ask someone else to step in for you. Ask someone else. Any other thoughts? John? Um, as Christians, I think this goes really well with what we've already been talking about, but if, if a brother uh, doesn't receive encouragement or spiritual help uh, that they need from their brethren, they won't get it. So right. It's not going to come from the world. If it That's doesn't true. come from their brethren, then it's not coming from anywhere. And we need to realize that when we see someone who may struggle and again, like you said, they may not be sinning necessarily. They may just be having difficulties and troubles and, and struggling. Right. Um, and, and if we don't help them, somebody in the world is not going to help them. I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll help them in a different way, but it's not going to be right. the way that God would want them to be assisted. And that's a good point. You know, even th there are a lot of quote-unquote, some would say good religious books in the world today, but they're all written by man. And there's nothing better than Christians helping other Christians. So if we don't do it, who will they go? I think it's a good point. And therein creates our accountability towards helping our brethren. Yeah. Any other thoughts? All right. Let's continue now. Let's look at James 5.16. Let's take this now a little bit deeper now into the category of trespasses. And um, Tommy, I think it's your turn. James 5.16. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Okay. And notice the way he breaks this down. Confess your trespasses to one another. And then do what? Pray. Pray for one another. <clears throat> Why? That you may be what? Healed. healed. I brought my healed discussion in a little bit early. <laughs> because I mean, there, here it is the passage where really it, it, we begin to see. It's not simply the forgiveness of sins that we seek, but a healing, if you would to help him to overcome the trespasses. Not simply to repent of one and be forgiven, but to be able to overcome them. But when he says confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another, is he saying there that an individual cannot pray for his own sin by himself? No. Again, we're talking about this help from one another. It's, it, 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 he's not creating here a, a, a practice of getting together in groups of three or four and just spilling your guts as to everything that you've done and then asking to pray for you. There are times where you may be having struggles with a particular trespass, particular sin, and maybe you've tried over and over and over again. So to help in the era or the area of accountability, you can find in a brother. So listen, I need your prayers. And this doesn't necessarily mean, does it, that we have to be specific with our trespasses as far as in mentioning them to our brothers. No. 
Okay. I don't think he. I don't think he means very. I don't think he's demanding specifics. I think the point is, we can go up to our brother and say, you know, I'm having a lot of trouble in this one area. Would you pray for me? And not be afraid to do that. You know, I, I have known in, in my years of preaching people to come forward uh, during the invitation song, and and they would say, "I need prayers of the congregation. I'm I'm having a problem, a struggle with particular sin, and I need the prayers of the church." And that's fine. But if there is an elder of the congregation, if there is a member in whom you trust and have confidence, go to them and ask them to pray for you as well. And the goal there, he says, the effective of a prayer of a righteous man avails much. The goal is for a righteous man to be praying for you and you to become righteous so that you might pray for others as well. All right, any thoughts about that? I think if you look at the latter two verses of that same chapter, completes the thought there because it entails more than just prayer. Uh, it may entail sitting down and studying the scriptures together and mm -hmm. praying over those scriptures because an individual who has a fault uh, may need more knowledge on the subject, may need encouragement. And so if you can do this as well as pray for them, then you might convert the individual, uh, which means convert them from their fault or their trespasses. That's a good point. Um, it's much more than trying to get them to say, I'm sorry for this one sin. It's trying to, to get them to grow past that sin and understand why. And you know, that I tell you what that takes, and sometimes we're impatient. That takes time, doesn't it? Time and commitment on our part to be there with them. That's a good point. Now. Good point. Any other thoughts? All right, let's bring in the next verse here. And... Um, Let's read that. Would you read for us, please, in Romans chapter 14, verse 13 here. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. All right. <clears throat> we have to keep in mind the context here of this particular passage, because if you pull this context out, you can have someone saying, therefore, let us not judge one another anymore. Therefore, you can't judge me. It's wrong to judge me. But contextually, he's not talking about that. As a matter of fact, Jesus in John 7, 24 tells us to judge with a righteous judgment. And Jesus himself in John 5, 30 said that he ju his judgment was righteous. And one more, Romans 1, 32, God's judgment is righteous. All right, so God's judgment is righteous, Romans 1.32. John 5.30, Jesus' judgment is righteous. Then Jesus in John 7.24, if he tells us to judge with righteous judgment, is it not the same type of judgment that God dispenses, that Christ dispenses? In other words, you see a situation and you simply judge it for what it is. If the Bible says it's sin, it's sin. Now, contextually here, what he's talking about is in the case of point where you have a weak brother, a brother weak in knowledge, and a brother is compelled by his conscience to believe that a particular act is wrong when in and of itself the act is not wrong. But the brother believes it is. You are not to stand in judgment of that brother because of his belief. And neither is that brother to judge you. And the contextually there is what it teaches. So what he says here, therefore let us not judge one another anymore, pardon me, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in a brother's way. This tells us that we have to give consideration to our brethren. All right, take for instance a little kid. I have a five-year-old son and I have a 10-year-old son and I have a 15-year-old daughter. Now, I... Well, except for the fact she just had surgery, can't lift anything over 10 pounds. Normally, I could give my 15-year-old daughter something that would weigh easily 35, 40 pounds and expect her to carry it into the house. But Micah, and I've not tested this with him, but I'd probably give him something that weighs about 30 or 25 pounds and say carry it into the house. <laughs> Jeremiah, we're going to limit it to something non-breakable and somewhere about... 
five, six, seven pounds, maybe. Now, that's very guess. I've never tested this here. I need to test it one day, I guess. The point is, though, you give consideration. It would be, it would be unreasonable to go to the five-year-old and say, here, I need you to carry this 30-pound bag of groceries into the house. You know, we got pumpkins out of the car the other day. All right, I could carry the pumpkin in. Mike could carry the pumpkin in. Hand and Orange could carry the pumpkin in. Jeremiah? No. All right. Now, we have brethren who are weaker. That is, we have new converts. We have people who have just maybe they've been converted out of something. And, and the belief that they've been converted out of, you know, has taught them that such and such is wrong when in reality the Bible doesn't say that it's wrong. Well, you don't go up to them and say, well, now that you're a Christian, you ought to be happy because now you can go do whatever, you know, it is under discussion there. And they may say, I cannot. That is wrong. And you don't look at them and say, what are you, dumb? You know, here's what, you don't treat them that way. You don't want to do anything that would put a stumbling block in front of them and to trip them up in the area of that which they believe to be wrong when in reality, of course, it is not. And eating of meats is, is the example used often in the scriptures here would pertain to this subject. But any thoughts or comments? But you know, sometimes someone will say, but you know what? No one can tell me what I can or cannot do. It's my right to do whatever I want. They should grow up. That's not the attitude. That's not the Spirit of God. God very well could have said about us, you just need to quit. I'm not going to do anything special for y'all. You've got it in you, in you to, to mind me do it. But he did he gave us his son because of his love for us. He gave us a propitiation. So we need to look upon others and care for them in the same way. All right, any thoughts? All right, Lansing, sir, would you read for us Romans 15, 1 through 2. One more verse in this particular section. We then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not please ourselves that each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. All right, this passage follows just nearly on the heels of what we looked at in Romans 14. You follow Romans 14, goes right into 15. And he tells the strong to bear with the scruples of the weak, the less knowledgeable, the Christians who maybe are not as mature within the faith. And he says, bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves, let each of us please his what? Please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. That's what it's all about. How can I make that person stronger? Leadership. A lot of good leadership programs will teach you to do your best to build up other people. You know, and then there's one, I think John Maxwell's his name. He's has written a lot of books on this. He talks about you have some leaders. They're fearful of being knocked off the totem pole. So they, they will not help to elevate any other person that could possibly be a threat to them. But the, the, the pattern, he suggests, is every leader should try to teach the person beside them to be the same type of leader. So they might lose their job to them, but that's okay. Your, your responsibility is to build everybody up to where you are. I mean, if your abilities are greater, you bring everybody up there. Instead of climbing up on the mountain yourself and looking down at the little bitty people, come up on the mountain with me. Let's all go up together. Well, as members of the body of Christ, that is the way that we are to be with one another. Not elevate one person. No one person say, I am smarter and better and more knowledgeable and more holy than everybody else. We look at one another and kind of look at someone and say, you know, he's, he's lagging a little bit. Let me see if I can help bring him up here. He's struggling some. Let me help. And someone may come to you and, and basically look at you and say, you're behind a little bit. Let me help pull you up. It's all about edification and building one another up. It is our responsibility as Christians to strengthen each other. <clears throat> Any thoughts? An example that Mr. Ron always used in Bible class was if you're a boss, you also need to encourage whoever your workers are because you're encouraging them will produce better workers. However, if you're always tearing them down and just being really negative, that's going to be the attitude that they eventually take on, and they're not going to be near as uh, efficient workers. Absolutely. Same thing goes in a household. Tear your kids down all the time. They're not going to amount to much while they're under your rule. Build them up. You'll give them that which they need. That's a good point. All right, any other thoughts? All right, the last one, we've got about five, six minutes left here. <clears throat> 
takes us over to Galatians 6, verses 1 through 4. And Miss Natalie, would you mind turning there in your Bibles to that? Galatians 6, 1 through 4, that is this. Christians have a responsibility to help a brother who is caught in sin. Very clear, very distinct. And so, Miss Natalie, would you read for us Galatians 6, verses 1 through 4, please? Brother, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, re restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself what less you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoiced, rejoicing in himself alone and not in others. All right. Notice there, beginning the very first thing says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are what? Spiritual. spiritual. You who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness. Now, we're looking at a contrast. When you mean spiritual, someone that's spiritually minded. Someone who, whose thoughts are on serving the Lord. And so if you see a brother who's overtaken in that trespass, he's guilty of sin, and he continues to commit that sin, go to him, those who are spiritual. But he says there very specifically, he says, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be what? Tempted. Tempted. Well, tempted to engage in the same trespass that he's guilty of, or what? Tempted to sin. Okay, what else? Look at the rest of the text here. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ, supporting their the command to go to him. But look at verse 3. For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. I think what Paul may be warning them here regarding, in regards to when he says, Consider yourself lest you also be tempted. I think he's talking about the pride of arrogance. Or the thought that you saved them. Or the thought that, you know, I'm better than you are, but, you know, you need to come up here with me. Um, something different. Maybe coming to them in a harsh manner. But he says, come to them in the spirit of gentleness. You have a responsibility to help them bear their burdens, help them to overcome the trespassers. You go to them and try to pull them out of it. If someone falls off a ship, and you're standing there, and the life preserver's right there with the rope. What's your responsibility? Throw it to them. Yeah, throw it to them. You know, there, there was a, terror, a tragic case, and it was in the news today. The, the, the murder is an old murder. The woman was, was kidnapped. Anyway, there was a 911 call made about a woman in a car who heard someone screaming and hollering in a car next to her. She followed that car for a time and was on the phone with the 911 operator. Well, what happened is, the way they said it, is the operator thought another operator was going to phone it in to the police. And that other operator thought the one who took the call was going to send it in. The woman might still be alive had that information been passed on to the, the, the police. And so what happens is you have an individual, it's not my responsibility. If you know of a brother who's overtaken in a fault, it becomes your responsibility. And oftentimes we sweep it under the rug and we, let, we say to ourselves, well, let someone else take care of it. Any thoughts? Yes. I think one of the keys to the spirit of gentleness is that we consider ourselves, and I think that's also the part here that we consider ourselves knowing that we have been in the same situation. We may not have been the exact same sin, but I think a lot of times we have this tendency to make other people's sins worse than ours. Uh, you know, well, well you're, you really need some help. Uh, yeah. I, I'm not so much needing help, but you really need it. And we need to be careful that's not our attitude. The whole beam and speck in the eye thing. Mm -hmm. Christ talks about. I think it's a good point, and that very well may be too what he's talking about. Um, any other thoughts? All right, Hannah, let's look over now and read James 5, 19 through 20. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns the sinner from the, er from the error of his way will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Okay. <clears throat> Pardon me. I like the way James starts that. 
If anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, anyone overtaken in a fall. All right. If we allow ourselves to give in to sin, we have wandered away from the truth. We're not with the truth any longer. We've wandered away from it. Now, someone turns us back. Let him know that he who turns is sinner. And that's interesting. Look at the next point. <clears throat> if you turn away from the truth, are you a sinner? Absolutely. If you stay at the level of truth and walk in truth, are you a sinner? No. Understand. I'll hear people say sometimes, they, they, they will say that I am a saved sinner. Now, I understand, I think, in principle what they're saying. They're saying that before they were lost in sin, but now they are saved. But as a Christian, God's expectation of us is not to sin. is to do our best to overcome it. So as long as we are walking in the truth, walking in the Spirit, walking according to the Scriptures, we're going to say no to temptation. When we say yes to temptation, we're wandering away. And if we don't repent and come back, hopefully someone will see our state and will come to us and turn us back and save our soul from death and cover our multitude of sins. Um, do you think James here is promising to cover a multitude of sins on the part of the one who has restored the brother? Or is he talking about the brother in error? Brother. He is. He's talking about the brother in error. Um, it's not like, you know, hey, I turned him back from sin, I'll get a hundred sins forgiven today on my part. And no, he's talking about the brother that you've helped restore. Alright, let's talk about consequences real quick. We've been discussing that people, that if we don't uphold our accountability, there are consequences for not doing so. So if we were going to talk about our responsibility to love one another, if we don't uphold, if, we're, if we don't uphold our accountability to that, what are the consequences? Separated from God. All right, separated from God. Okay. How can we say that we love God when we hate a brother? Okay. Um... Is it going to harm our relationship with that brother? Oh, absolutely. You never know what might have happened had you just been kind towards them, you know, and shown them the proper love. Christians have responsibility of strengthening each other. So what happens if we don't strengthen each other? We won't be strengthened ourselves. Okay, we won't be strengthened ourselves. What else? And nobody else is going to strengthen you. Yeah, you've got a brother here who's still floundering around who needs help, and you're not willing to help them. All right, so now your, the consequences upon you is going to be that you have fallen short of God's law for you. But now you're hurting them, but not rendering to them what is due them. And then if a Christian, if you know a brother who is in sin, you don't go to him, you don't try to, to pull him back. What's the consequences of that? You also are in sin. Yeah. That's right, you also are in sin. And if you wait on everybody else to restore him and everybody else has your attitude, the brother may not pull out of it. I mean, he's still accountable for his decisions or her decisions. But we're accountable for our responsibility towards them. Okay, any thoughts or comments about this? Tommy? It sounds like with all these things about, you know, strengthening each other and helping each other out, it seems if you get a congregation that's not doing these things, you're going to have, it's a very apathetic congregation. And it sounds like kind of Laodicea from Revelation. And you know how God feels about that. So, yeah. That's an excellent point. Um, and I think one that needs to be really taken to heart. If you have all brethren behaving in this way, you're going to have an active congregation, one that looks out after one another. But if they don't, you're right. Apathy sets in. And the quality of lukewarmness becomes present. That's a good point. And a great lesson for all congregations to learn, all members. All right, any other thoughts? Oh, John. Mm -hmm. I was going to say all these, I think, would apply that um, if we don't do any one of these three that we've been talking about, we may eventually lose our brother. Yes. Uh, personally, the one that I was looking at when I wrote this, as far as the love, if we don't show the love and concern for our brother, if they get more love and concern from the world than they do from their brethren, uh, likelihood is they're going to become discouraged eventually, and they may eventually fall away. You know, I think, I think there have been people who have left the church because what they were needing, they didn't get. And, and I don't mean social entertainment, okay? What they were needing spiritually, they weren't getting locally. Now, you've got, and, and, and here again, I'm talking about someone who's weak, who's in need, and nobody's going to them. Now, you have to ask the question, what have they done? <coughs> have they sought help? You know, have they done their part? But oftentimes with that apathy in place, people end up saying, well, I'm more loved over there than I am here. 
And it may not be the case, but as far as what they see and what they were shown, that's what's defined for them. Um, any other thoughts, comments about that? Okay. In the end, our service to the church is, as John Kennedy once said, but not in reference to the church, ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. Every Christian should not ask, what can the church do for me, but what can I do for the congregation? And bring that to a local level. Ask not what your brother can do for you, but what you can do for your brother. And trying to build them up. And I guarantee you, if we work to build other people up, we're going to be built up ourselves. We're going to be built up ourselves. All right, any other thoughts? Yeah, one last comment. Yes. Um, so if Jonathan could have been put to death for correcting a king, when he went to David, <clears throat> but he loved God and David's soul more than he cared about his own safety. We need to love the souls of our brethren. Good point. Good point. If you didn't hear that, and the, the comment had to do with Jonathan. Jonathan went to bat for David, and his father, he could be killed by his father, but that didn't matter to Jonathan. He loved the soul of his brother. It's a good point. Very good point there. All right. <clears throat> Let's see. I appreciate all the participation comments, those sending in questions and comments. Thank you very, for, very, very much for that. Continue to do so. If we receive um, any questions or comments during the course of the week, then please do send those in. We will address those at our next class period. Next week, let's look at accountability to authority. I know we're taking this somewhat slowly, but we're trying to build it, and I don't want to really rush through it. But we have two final, <coughs> pardon me, two final sections. We have accountability to authority, and then building up ultimately to accountability to the Lord, and that's what we're building up to with all this. Let's, we have one more song, and after that song, we'll be dismissed in a word of prayer. And I'm going to ask Lance, if you would, to lead our minds in the prayer at that time. And then afterwards, uh, the class will be over. Again, thank you so much for viewing from your homes, and we appreciate your attention to spiritual matters and willingness to study with us. And if you're in the Oklahoma City area, members of this congregation, we encourage you to come out sometime and be with us. We've got a good number here tonight as well, though. All right, so let's go ahead, and that last song we're going to be singing is song number, oh, before we do this song, what's the song number, Travis? 476. 476, I did have it written down, thank you. Savannah Long. Savannah Long is, um, if I understand correctly, her parents are members at 84th Street, aren't they? Mm -hmm. They are, okay. Mm -hmm. um, and she's, uh, she's a cousin to uh, Tyler oh. Hoagland, Tyler Hoagland, as well as the other Hoaglands, the Hoagland boys. Anyway, she is in a serious situation in the hospital with pneumonia and the H1N1 virus. And so the family members have been soliciting prayers on her behalf. And she's 11, 11 years old. So keep her in your minds and in your prayers. It's, um, for some people, this H1N1 virus comes and makes you uncomfortable, a little bit of fever, and it goes away. For other people, there are other complications that follow. And... Uh, so let's, let's keep her in our, in our prayers. Her name is Savannah Long.